Well, if everything's in place, uh, you know, we have the new, we have the new setup. Uh, we have that new, that fresh new title screen. Ooh la la. Ooh la la. Oh, look at those bits fly. But you know what? Biddy the snake is protecting them, if not eyeing them for food. Thought I'd pop in and watch a bit before I sleep, as I probably won't catch you when I'm awake. Yeah, I, Lasaria, the time differences, um, they are what they are. Hey, thank you for playing uh, some uh, Jackbox games with us last night, too, Lasaria. Uh, that was really cool of you to do. And I hope that your uh, Megado campaign setting is uh, going along well. Uh, it looked like you were doing some more maps uh, earlier. Uh, I, I stop in when I can. I, I may not always say something, because if I'm on the run... Like, uh, if, if I'm driving or something, I'll, I like I might pop on Twitch uh, and make sure that I can try and give you a view, even if I can't say anything, and then I might kind of ninja out of there. Uh, hey, Coffee Cat exists. Welcome. Ah, next week. Very good. Very good, Lasaria. Well, we have a lot of cat folks in here. Uh, I hope that you all don't mind, then as we delve into Dungeons and Doggies. Uh, for however long it takes, I, I don't think this is going to be an extremely... Uh, th this isn't going to be... Can it be Tuesday yet? Uh, well, um, I I'm not upset at the pace of things. Uh, I was hoping to get the ritual done last night, but I think with the way things turned out, it's fine, and we'll get to the ritual. There, there will be another Tuesday. Um, and if not, it's probably because, like, the sun's exploding, and honestly, there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, we'll probably have about seven seconds from the time that we notice it starts happening to when it actually hits us. Daily, I never ninja in here. Wait. <laughs> well, welcome, uh, welcome, Ninja Daily. You're welcome to, uh, retract back to the shadows and ever observe. Now, you may remember that we went over this... Oh, jeez. Was it six months ago? I, no, it might have been less. Um, at, this was a Kickstarter. Uh, this was a Kickstarter um, project. And that was for the... Oh, shoot. I should have grabbed the minis. Uh, mind powers. Uh, no, it's not working. Um, I, I'll show off the mini. I'll, I'll get up during break and grab them. Are you going to a version of this for the... Are you going to a version of this for the bird race books? Uh, what, do you mean Humblewood? Or what, what do you... I, I don't know what you're talking about, Lasaria. Oh, Humblewood. You know, uh, I've been debating... I've been debating uh, getting in on that Kickstarter. Hang on. Let, let, me, let me bring it up, because... Uh, Humblewood's gonna be... Uh, is gonna be... Up soon. Yeah, there's 10 hours left on Humblewood. I was hem-hawing because uh, Humblewood, and I, this is not a knock against the uh, against the people who created this uh, this fifth edition supplement, uh, but it is set up as a it is set up as its own retail like outlet, and I was really hoping that as a store. Uh, they might have an option for physical stores to uh, to to help them, right? And it's usually something like uh, discounted six physical books, because that way I could get it in. I can get it in my store. I can promote it uh, to my play groups that come in, and um, there there's not a retailer friendly 
Uh, there's not a retailer-friendly package. And so I was kind of disappointed by that because I think there's a lot that I could do. But as a retailer, buying it at retail price and then reselling it uh, would be kind of ridiculous. Uh, and so I, I feel a little kind of crowded out in that sense. It is ending soon, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe maybe I'll pick up uh, the baseline PDF so that I could bring it up on here. I, I don't mind going over that stuff. Um, so, we'll, we'll see. I don't know, I, I might do a kind of a minimalistic approach. Uh, the, the minis look okay. I don't know if I feel compelled to get the miniatures. So, yep, all right. <laughs> it, it, that's a good reminder. And of course, hey, if any of you see uh, interesting Kickstarter projects that you think fall within the interests of the community here, you know, it could be dice, it could be supplements, it could be stuff like that, feel free to share it on, on Discord. Uh, board games uh, certainly fall within our purview. What's the opposite of a tabaxi? A tadago. Ten dollars for the PDF. I could not say no. Yeah, you know, daily. I'll I'll probably just do a minimalistic. Um, you know, I'll throw my hat in the arena there, and um, and that way I'll have something to consider. And if I if I, I want to put it on on stream, uh, I could throw it on stream, and we can go over the Humblewood stuff. All right, so. Lots of stuff here, including some character sheets for the miniatures that uh, that come into uh, the, that are in that that box full of beautiful doggos. The inn was quiet at this time of day. Just a few patrons muttering into their cups, and the sound of driving rain outside splattering against the windows. Only the occasional cry of someone slipping in the churned mud broke the rhythmic drumming of water on the roof and walls. In the corner furthest from the fire, long shadows stretched over a table dragged close to the wall. The taller of the two men at the table leaned forward. Three silver, he said with an air of finality. The smaller man tried unsuccessfully to hide his disappointment. That ain't much for such a job, he countered. First pursed his lips, pausing only to kick away a stinking cur begging for food. The dog drew back and scuttled into the corner just out of reach and huddled submissively. There will be thirty of the brothers here, he said, counting off points on his fingers. So this is not dangerous. Further, there will be no killing this time. He paused a moment, and his opposite lifted one skeptical eyebrow. Finally, the Overfather will personally review the outcome. Or I guess that might be uh, back to him. Uh, so, in fact, there's an opportunity to make a good impression. The negotiations continued as the filthy dog wandered out of the inn, looking for a better chance at a meal. I tell you, Sirindel, it's serious work. I could have had. I could have died. The stinking cur told. Oh, now we're in a dog voice. Jeez. Uh, this is this is a first impression, by the way. Um, I tell you, Sirendel, it's serious work. I could have died, the stinking cur told a silver-haired elven bard later. Uh, once she'd cleaned off the disgusting the disgusting mess of wax, mud, and uh, fox scat in the pond, she muttered under her breath and her damp and matted fur was instantly dry and tangle-free. The party, the bard, a dwarven fighter, and a half-orc cleric, sat round a welcome fire upon which sat a bubbling pot of stew and bread warming beside it. Occasionally, the dwarf looked hopefully towards the stew. Okay, Callie, the bard sighed. I'll write a damn song about your incredible spying abilities later. Just tell us when the cultist scum are going to lay the ambush and where. I've got a bruise, Callie muttered under her breath, and then, satisfied that her canine contribution was fully appreciated, and also quite looking forward to dinner as well, started her report. There'll be 30 of them, setting the, uh, setting the ambush a week next Thursday, just past the ruined windmill. <laughs> w 
Welcome to Dungeons and Doggies, the first of the animal adventures. The rules presented here allow you to play humankinds or elvenkinds or dwarvenkinds, best friend, the noble and companionable dog. There are racial rules, class options, feats, and other rules to allow for the addition of a dog character to a party or even a whole party of canine adventurers. Dogs and delightfulness. There is a unique delight in providing rules to play a dog character. There are few, if any, animals that are as closely bonded to humans as dogs, and they have been our companions and partners for a long period of history. So it feels somehow... Uh, I'm sorry, so it feels somehow right that they get their time at the table with other adventurers. The style of play described for dogs assumes they will fulfill that role of companion and support, with dogs being both self-sufficient and, through their class choices, a very supportive part of the adventuring party. Note that the rules are not intended to represent anthropomorphic dogs. No, bipedable, uh, no bipedal opposable thumb-owning dogs here. Instead, they assume some manner of event that has imbued a dog with intellectual awakening and self-awareness without altering their physical makeup. As such, there are a few assumptions made to ensure that the character you create can interact with the wider world. Communication and tool use are both discussed within these rules, and options for new equipment ideas are also suggested. Some canine classes are easier to imagine than others, though with a little thought, no class option becomes completely impossible to integrate into your DM's world. The best course is to talk to your fellow players and ensure everyone is on a similar page with your ideas. The miniature figure you choose to represent your canine adventurer gives you plenty of clues as to the ways they could interact with the world. For example, a dog wizard has a spell book in its harness. Does that mean your dog can read? Or the rogue with a dagger held in its tail? Has it now gained an extra prehensile limb? None of these questions or answers should prevent the fun from happening at the table. In a world filled with fire-breathing, flying lizards, a dog able to fire a crossbow shouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility. That's another system of doggo. Is this a... Oh, it's through Onyx Path. It's called uh, Pugmire. Perhaps... Onyx Path, are you out there? By the way, Onyx Path is on Twitch. Onyx Path, are you out there? I summon you to this channel, the Onyx Path. Are you out there? Uh, I've, I've, uh, Onyx has been around. But yes, I have heard of Pugmire. And thank you for sharing that. Oh, you have to say their name three times. Onyx, the Onyx Path, the Onyx Path, the Onyx Path! It's showtime! Oh, yes. The most important thing is that your dog characters get to feel sufficiently doggy in the way the rules support the role-playing. Whether as a single canine member of a traditional adventuring group or as part of a complete pack of hounds out to make their mark on the world. Have fun, sniff a few trees, and always, always enjoy a good belly rub now and again. And I'll tell you, if that Pomeranian monk doesn't enjoy a good old-fashioned belly rub, the likes they don't make these days... Uh, I don't know who could actually appreciate that. Wait, is that a Pomeranian? Or is that a... Or is, is that a Papillon? Let's see. Who is the monk? It is a Pomeranian monk. Nightingale, the Pomeranian monk. I don't think we have a... <clears throat> pardon me. 
Gotta wet my whistle a little bit more. I don't think we have a a papillon. No. That's okay, though. Before starting your doggy adventures, it is worth deciding what role dog characters play in your world. Most right-thinking folk will want lots of interesting four-legged friends in their games, but that might not suit everyone, so below are some ideas on how to best handle having canine characters in your adventures. Your uh, if you're flying solo, your character is one of a kind. It can be a great role-playing opportunity to be the only adventurous dog in a Zawarodo, capable of holding their own with their bipedal counterparts. This idea has the character as a marvelous spectacle, sure to be commented on frequently and subject to their own plots, involving foes attempting to kidnap the dog or other adventures. It might inspire the DM and players to consider why they're, they are so unique, or build a game around discovering the source of the character's abilities. Is it a curse or a gift? One of each. Rather than being truly unique in the doggy world, perhaps there's only one of each breed, which has reached the height of adventurer. Questions to answer, either before the campaign or during play, include what happens when a character dies of old age or adventurous causes? Does another Chihuahua become awakened when the previous adventurer finally lays down their head? Or are these just the first brave souls? The spearhead of many more to come. The spearhead of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the characters are likely individuals of note in the world, and many plots and adventures will focus purely on their existence. Dogs and dexterity. Yeah, it's a table. <laughs> hey, one of them, they're uh, chihooey hooey, chihooey hooey dogs, aren't they? Ain't they? A common issue canine adventurers will encounter is a lack of hands. DMs and players should not shy away from exploring this issue. Dogs are quite unique, and overcoming this issue is a role-playing and story opportunity. Maybe your character uses a pouch with spell components in an, in an easy muzzle reach. Maybe the local smith can modify tools for mouth use. Perhaps you use magic, or perhaps you just have your companions help you. Figuring out the ways you adapt your new place in the world is part of the fun of being a dog in the thumb owner's world. Best of breed. Talking, adventuring dogs are not uncommon in the world with this approach, but the characters are among the best and brightest, with one or more making up a part of any group. Many songs are sung in the Tavern of Doggy Heroes, past and present. Most adventuring groups have uh, have one or more canine companions. They're not at all unusual. It's likely that there are specialist shops selling dog-optimized gear and taverns with an attached kennel club, catering for doggies with a menu of meaty treats and comfortable lounging couches. In this world, in this world, DM should remember that villainous foes might include clever canines. Indeed. The major mastermind behind nefarious, a nefarious plot could be a wicked Labrador. This summer. Nictorak, welcome. A wicked Labrador. If there are good boys, there must also be bad boys too. And uh, you're just going to have to adventure for that, you know. You're going to get that plus two rolled up newspaper. And uh, someone's gonna have to get the uh, someone's gonna have to get the uh, the ever squirting hose of cold water. Oh yes, the cone of shame, truly, truly a cursed item. <laughs> Dogs for everyone! Who wouldn't want a world full of four-legged friends? Using this principle, doggy characters are as commonplace and normal as any other race. Zawarodo has adapted around them, with most buildings being constructed with dogs as well as humanoids in mind. There is a furry friend in all walks of life, from city leaders to army regiments, bankers, bakers, or candlestick makers. 
Talking dogs have always been a part of the world, and it's all perfectly natural. The DM should give some thought to Dogs Gone Bad, and what a group of canine bandits and ruffians might look like. A bad dog could easily be the major antagonist of a story. No one wants to contemplate a St. Bernard transformed into a lich with a horde of undead followers, though. Surely. A negative charisma bonus? Oof. Oof. So there we go. A St. Bernard Lich. What concoctions does it carry in the barrel around its neck? Or is that its phylactery? Interesting choice, though, if that's the case, because then it's right there. A dog's life. The more commonly intelligent dogs are encountered, the more the world should reflect this. Equipment and weapon makers will tailor their wares for wealthy doggy adventurers. Canine guilds will form. Dogs will seek positions of power and influence. And not every doggy is, an, is as altruistic as some. Underdog crime gangs are a, are real and ex, uh, are a real and exciting threat. Able to hide within society easily due to the two legs being so bad at identifying individual dogs. All right, now, uh, so we have some uh, considerations for the, you know, the, the the campaign environment, the the tone. Um, the prompting on getting you to think, if you allow this, what could happen? And I can think of some very easy ways, even beyond what was presented above, to work a doggy character into your own story. I say that, you know, we haven't looked at the crunch yet. If these are broken characters or, you know, oh, completely over the top, OP uh, dogs are superior to their humanoid counterparts. They could be, or it could be the opposite, or maybe, maybe this is just something that's not overpowered, not underpowered. It's just different. In which case, they're bringing some very interesting choices to the table. Dog racial rules. The sound of the horns warned of the the, the sound of the horns warned of the raiders' approach. Even before Allen had begun to roll out of her tent and draw her kniffs, Oak was already moving, low to the ground with his hackles raised and a barely audible growl in his throat. He was an old dog now, gray at the muzzle and deaf in one ear. They'd grown together, dark-skinned girl and snow-white dog never apart. Oak had been as true and strong as the, th three, as the tree whose name he bore. Comforting her through loss, joyous in play, unfailing in trust and deadly in defiance of his family. If tonight, protecting the children of the village below, was the night they fell, it would be as they had lived, together as one, human and dog, a bond not even death could break. The warmth of a roaring hearth fire, the breathless joy of the hunt, the trackless paths of a long journey, provided they are close to the ones they call family and pack, dogs can call anywhere home. For much of history, dogs have been stalwart companions, faithful guardians, and beloved kin to their two-legged allies. Loyalty, faith, devotion, and selflessness have guided the dog through the ages. Compact and diverse. Endlessly variable, constantly adaptable, dogs have been shaped by their entwined history with other races until little trace of their wild ancestry remains. Now, a breed of dog seems to exist for every possible niche within society and for every task. From great shaggy hunting dogs to the tiniest of lap dogs, the variety of the canine form seems without bounds. Generally, dogs tend to live between 10 and 15 years and reach adulthood around 18 months old. While it is usual for dogs to live with families or individuals of other races, Dogs will also form their own groups for strength and companionship. A wide array of natural colors and coats occur, and thus individual dogs are easily identified by other races visually, even though they rely on more of their sense of smell for such things themselves. 
Dogs are naturally loyal to those they sense as a pack. This trait carries through to intelligent dogs from their wilder kin. Those who claim a dog is a friend have a true and unshakable companion for life. Affable and upbeat, dogs live for the now and enjoy experiencing curiosity and adventure. They have few emotional filters and can switch from effervescent joy to melancholy in a moment. However, they shed black moods very easily and seem incapable of holding a grudge or harboring ill feeling. Dogs are easily moved to help others and relieve suffering and will be generous with their affection and time. Dogs have the capacity to make their homes almost anywhere that they choose, but the most common places they are found is within the settlements of other races, acting in a wide range of roles. Wild dogs do also thrive under different circumstances in the more temperate areas of the world. Intelligent dogs tend to remain closely linked with their adopted society or the wild areas they knew as pups. However, a dog's sense of home is usually defined by their company rather than a place and dogs are comfortable traveling widely as long as they have the constancy of friendship. Dogs gifted with unusual intelligence seek adventure for many reasons. It is common that answers to questions about why they are different to their kind are driving force, but equally the desire to make a difference will motivate many dogs. Their distinctive urge to support and assist coupled with the ability to reflect on the world in deep terms can be more than enough to lead a dog from the warmth of a home and into a wider world. The diversity of dogs is hard to generalize, but dogs begin with the following traits. Oh, that's great, Nick Drack. Um, Are you willing to share a picture of that on, on Discord? I'd love to see what you what you had uh, whipped up. All right, so a base uh, these are base dog stats. Your charisma score increases by one. Uh, age is what it is. Uh, alignments tend toward good alignments due to their natural urge to be helpful, but there are exceptions. Size. Dogs vary in height and length enormously. Your size is dependent on your sub-race. Uh, base walking speed is 30 feet. Languages. You can speak and read common and two extra languages of your choice. Note that dogs do not necessarily use speech. Whilst they can understand their chosen languages... The specifics of how they communicate are left to the players. Some possibilities include having the full ability of speech, being uncannily effective at conveying means through gesture and sounds. Yeah, I think I think she's saying the kids are down the well. Or having another character who can understand and interpret for the dog. Regardless of how the dog expresses itself, it is assumed that it is communicating with its allies with sufficient fluency as to avoid any penalties to roles. Yes, Hivalon, Timmy fell down the well. How did you know? Dogs have advantage on perception checks based on smell or hearing and disadvantage on perception checks depending upon color recognition. Now, as presented, this makes sense. Um, and in fact, you know, there's nothing saying that even in the player's handbook, you can't have a character who uh, has one eye and so could have a specific uh, visual perception drawback, or if you've ever played a character who is colorblind. Now, dark vision kind of imposes that uh, because you, you only see in grayscale. Um, this is something that if it could create problems, you know, depending on, on color, you know, you're, here you are playing a, a very optimistic dog character, and you roll up to, you know, one of your friends in the party and, you know, you want to give them some advice because they're down, you know, and you go, look, it's, it's a new day. We're here. The, the grass is gray. The sky is gray. It's just a beautiful day today, isn't it? Um, you know, so th that's something that you could discuss. Um, you know, is it a limitation? Or if we're considering having sentient talking dogs, do you get... You get slightly uh, upgraded eyeballs, and so you can see particular colors 
And you can see all colors. Uh, best friend, dogs may cast the Charm Person spell using Charisma as the spellcasting ability once per long rest. No spell components are necessary. The DC for this ability is 8 plus your Charisma modifier. Worse than Bark, you have a natural bite attack. You are proficient with this attack and it counts as both a weapon attack and an unarmed attack. This attack does 1d4 plus your strength modifier damage. This increases to 1d6 plus your strength modifier at level 5 and 1d8 plus strength at level 10. So you do get... Um, hmm, if this counts as a weapon... I'll have to check the feats, uh, but that, that could make for some interesting feat interactions um, with your bite. Many breeds, many forms. Dogs have such a variety of shapes and breeds that they are highly diverse. Choose one of the following sub-races to reflect your chosen breeding and select one breed ability from the list on the right. Uh, now note, dogs as presented are a powerful race with many benefits. However, as any dog owner will know, dogs' lives are brief and intense. An intelligent dog will have to accept that its fellow adventurers will outlive it, maybe many times over, and the quest to extend the life of a canine adventurer may form the basis of some powerful storytelling. Equally, the same dog may choose to accept its balloted life, or its balloted time, and live its life as fully as it can, and do the most possible with the time it has. You know, in this sense, um, dogs are to humans as humans are to, you know, dwarves, elves, gnomes. And so it is. It it is interesting, you know, that the mortality uh, is a, a, a poignant thing to bring up in the course of a campaign. All right, sub race a, a big dog. Big dogs are the strongest and most physically imposing uh, mammals in the canine family. Mastiffs, Saint Bernards, and uh, Alsatians all fall into this size of breed. Uh, your size is medium. Increase your constitution score by one. When you use your bite attack, you roll two dice for damage and choose the higher result. For a critical hit, roll three dice and choose the best two results. If you're a regular dog, regular dogs may be the most common sized dogs and tend to be known for energy and hail sturdiness. This includes spaniels, bulldogs, and many crossbreeds. Your size is medium. Uh, your strength score increases by one. Once per long rest, when you are reduced to zero hit points, you may immediately roll a hit dice to heal that many hit points. And Lapdog, which Ivlon uh, seems to show some favor to here. Tiny of body, but giant of heart, Lapdogs are known for nimble movement and fearless attitude. This category includes oh, them their uh, Chihui Hui's, Terriers, and Mal uh, Maltese. Your size is small. Your dexterity score increases by one. If your attack is a critical hit, you may dodge as a free action after resolving the attack as you're slippery. Uh, you attack and defend. Dogs are an almost infinitely varied species and as such are represented by the sub-races and the following breed abilities. These are intended to help reflect a certain breeding or classic role of dogs that dogs are renowned for. You may choose two of these abilities at level one. So we have race, we have sub-race, 
and then we're going to get to specialize our our character breed. Rhodey, you got it. You got it. If you're using the optional feat rules, then instead of taking a feat choice, you may take an extra choice from this breed abilities list. Assistance dog, you are gifted at guiding others. You can nominate a creature within five feet of you as a bonus action. Whilst in this range, it benefits from your keen senses trait as if it possessed the trait itself. At their heels, you are skilled in dogging your opponent no matter what. When you uh, or when a target provokes an opportunity attack from you, if you hit, then you may also move up to half your movement speed towards your foe. Bloodhound. You are a master of tracking. You have advantage on wisdom survival checks on roles related to tracking a target using scent. Catch and fetch. You are skilled at snatching things from the air and retrieving them. You can use your reaction to reduce the damage from a ranged weapon attack by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier. If you reduce the damage to zero in this way, you catch the weapon. Oh, excellent, Nick Direct. Uh, I'll bring it up here shortly. Cattle Dog. You are a natural at hurting your quarry. When you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, you may move that creature up to 10 feet in any direction before it resolves the rest of its movement. You'd allow them in your homebrew? Uh, so what, what thoughts are occurring to you, Nick Direct? I mean, obviously you're familiar with the world that you're presenting. How could a, how could a doggo character like this fit in? Cattle Dog. You are a natural at hurting your quarry. When you hit a creature with an opportunity attack... Oh, I'm sorry, I already read that. A comforting companion. You are a soothing presence. When you share an entire short or long rest with up to six creatures, uh, you choose within 30 feet of you, each regains its hit points equal to your level. You could be a digger. You just have to dig. You have advantage on ability checks for digging. In combat, if you are in an environment which can be dug into by your paws, you may make an action to go prone and gain half cover. A uh, or dogged persistence. Hello, Genli. Welcome. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it, it has been a minute, hasn't it? You'll be lurking? No problem. Thanks for uh, popping in and saying hi. You possess boundless energy and determination. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to gain resistance to all of the triggering damage. After you use this ability, you can't use it again until you complete a short or long rest. A faithful friend. You are able to aid those around you just by your presence. Once per short rest, as your reaction, when an ally you can see within 30 feet fails a saving throw, ability check, or attack roll, use your reaction to allow them to attempt the roll again. You can also use this reaction to force an opponent to re-roll a successful attack against an ally you can see within 30 feet. Nick Direct says, so I run an inspired Eberron slash high fantasy inspired game. They could be imbued just like Warforged. I'd allow a dog to have a soul. Well, as the movie states, all dogs go to heaven. So duh, they have to have a soul. <laughs> you know what? I actually recently rewatched that movie. Uh, it was a couple months ago. Uh, I was on a bit of a... Uh... Oh, why am I derping on the animator's name? Secret of Nim, All Dogs Go to Heaven, used to be with Disney and left and started doing his own thing. Uh, he did the, uh, um, he did the Dragon's Lair. He directed the Dragon's Lair video games as well. Uh, Don Bluth, 
Don uh, Don Bluth is his name. There we go. Yep, you got it. Thank you, Neo Realms. Um, yeah, I was having a bit of a Don Bluth uh, binge a couple months ago, and so it was uh, uh, it was nice. Uh, yeah, I think there were a few of them. Um, I, I only watched the one because, uh, um, you know, for, for reasons, um, you know, Amazon will let you watch the, the first of a series, which are almost, almost always the best. And then if you want to watch the ones that were like straight to DVD, uh, you got to pay them 10 bucks. I'm like, what? I'll just go and buy it for a dollar at the, you know at a used DVD store. Uh, but, you you know, if you want me to watch, to pay $10 for a sequel uh, that was straight to DVD while I get the original theatrical release as part of Prime, sure, okay. <laughs> there are a few sequels that I would definitely pay for. Um... Uh, also, hi, hi, New Realms. Uh, lastly, frenzied fighting. You are adept at the frantic combination of barking, scratching, biting, and general chouse that typifies some dogs when they are enraged. Once per long rest, you may cause each creature in a 15-foot cube originating from you to make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save... A creature takes 2d8 damage and is pushed 10 feet away from you. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage and isn't pushed. Now, a couple things about these abilities that we're going over. Oh, alright, hey, thank you, GM Vault. Derek can't wait for Cobra Kai season. Yeah, I, I heard that, uh, I think it was you and a couple other people were saying that season one is well worth, uh, well worth watching. Um, so a couple things in this document, which is, I think is still in the works. This is simply the revised version of, well, the, if you remember, or if you go back into our, our YouTube chronicles, um, you know, with the initial play test, uh, something like frenzied fighting does need a touch up because it talks about a save, but it doesn't discuss how the save is calculated. What kind of a save, and what's the number I'm looking for, right? Um, as well, I mean, that's a... Um, frenzied fighting is is pretty good. Um, you know, I... It, it's better than a... Uh, it's better than a Dragonborn breath weapon. And so I think some of these people are going to take uh, very frequently because they are just functionally uh, a lot better. Um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of thematics. Uh, faithful Friend um, as a short rest, uh, as a reaction. Uh, the fact that you can help an ally or hinder... Um, or, uh, or hinder like an attack roll. Uh, from 30 feet away. I mean, that one's pretty good, too. You know, a, a lot of the other ones beyond these last two, I think, are, are more, you know, they're generalized. Uh, I think they do add, um, they do add uh, a flavor you know, the, even the catch and fetch, I don't think that's necessarily overpowered. Um, use your reaction. So, let's see, at most... Oh, pardon me. You could reduce... Unless you have magical, like, super magical dexterity, you could reduce something by 15 points of damage. That might be a little high. I mean, the possibility on that. 
um, especially because we're not talking about a, you know, a monk that has, uh, you know, catch missiles or, or deflect missiles. Um, up above, it did say that these are these are strong like racial support abilities, and I can understand that. I think a couple of these though still need some revision, uh, especially frenzied fighting. Yeah. Um, some more here. Grabbing bite. You have a strong and powerful mouth and neck. When you succeed in hitting a creature of your size or smaller with your bite attack, you may also declare it grappled. Mm, pardon. You may use this ability against a creature larger than you, but if you do... Your move becomes zero. So that's, I mean, nitpicky, but it should probably say movement. Your movement becomes zero while grappling, and you will move along with the grappled creature. Guard dog, you are gifted at reacting to attacks on your companions. If an ally is hit by an attack within five feet of you, this is something else for consistency's sake, um, they spell out five instead of using the number. So, I don't know, anyone out there from Dungeons and Doggies that are watching this, uh, you know, later on on YouTube or whatever, uh, I don't think there's anyone necessarily watching us live there. Um, these are just little nitpicks uh, that I'm picking up here. Uh, you may use your reaction to make an attack against the attacker. You can be a hunting hound. You are a natural at seeking the quarry of your allies. You have advantage on an attack roll against a creature if at least one of your allies is within five feet of the creature and the ally isn't incapacitated. Who? That one... That one can be big. Um, because now, as this is stated, uh, this is just an attack roll. And so, I mean, this is giving barbarians uh, free, um, free reckless attack. Uh, this, is giving, this is giving wizards uh, free advantage on their ranged spell attacks. Flanking without flanking? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, Nick Direct. Incessant barking. You have a bark that is hard to ignore, driving foes to distraction. Once per long rest, you may affect all creatures within a 15-foot cube. The target must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, it takes 2d8 damage and must immediately use its reaction, if available, to move as far as its speed allows away from you. The creature doesn't move into obviously dangerous ground, such as a fire or a pit. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage and doesn't have to move away. A deafened creature automatically succeeds on the save. Um, again, it's telling us that, you know, a wisdom saving throw. What's the difficulty? You're going to head to bed? All right, coffee. Thanks for popping in and, uh, and saying hi. Like a spicy, yeah. And, you know, something like that. I, I reckon I could ask, uh, you know, would this work? Is, is this magical? Um, I mean, as a, as this type of dog, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I doubt it would work in a silence, an area of silence. But as a level one... 
as a level one creature, this is pretty powerful. I mean, even for uh, even for a couple levels, um, it's pretty powerful. And if it's a uh, it's once per day. I don't know. Maybe, maybe does that match up with the uh, the Dragonborn Breath Weapon? Are they trying to use that as a baseline? Uh, no, because it's 2d6. After that, it'll fall off. Yeah, yeah. Old dog, new tricks. Choose two skills and gain proficiency in both. Um, so as a as an initial racial, I guess that's not terrible uh, because you can just be super skillful uh, on top of then your class. Um, as a replacement, though, I mean, why why take this if you could just take the skilled feat, um, which gives you three skills or languages or tool use, if I recall correctly. Retriever, you are a natural at seeking and returning desired items. You gain advantage on intelligence investigation checks. Shake it off. Once per long rest, you may, sh you may take advantage on any saving throw to end a condition currently affecting you. The condition can be blinded, blinded, deafened, paralyzed, or poisoned. Uh, snow dog, you love the snow. You are naturally adapted to cold climates, as described in Chapter 5 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Sprinter, you are built for bursts of impressive speed. Increase your base movement by 10 feet. When you use the dash action, you can ignore the first opportunity attack you would provoke. Whew, that's a pretty good one. Because often, you might only ever get the one. Uh, so, I mean, what, is it going to happen all the time? No, but that's that's a free... Um, I mean, th that's a free uh, disengage. So not only are you faster... Um, but you can, you're just a lot more mobile. Uh, the eyes have it. You are just the cutest. You have advantage on any charisma based ability checks. Unfortunately, this ability cannot be used against hostile creatures. I mean, good condition on there, I suppose. Still, you know, with the fact that there's, uh, that there's some limitations on some prior abilities. Uh, I don't know if making it available to all charisma abilities is the best way for that. I mean, maybe if this was going for persuasion or... Um, well, I don't know. I, I guess with the eyes, eyes are expressive. You could intimidate someone with your eyes. Uh, still, though, I think all giving... Giving advantage on all charisma-based um, ability checks is... Uh, th that one's pretty powerful, too. Yeah, a stare down. Yeah, you could intimidate. You could deceive with your eyes. Uh, thick coat. Your thick and glossy fur is a natural defense. You have an armor class of 12 plus your dexterity modifier when not wearing armor. 90% of all communication is nonverbal. Upright and alert. You can never be surprised. If your party is surprised, you will act normally in initiative order. I get what they're going for. I, technically, there's not a surprise round. It's roll into initiative, and then there's a, the surprised condition. But... I mean, that's that's uh, me being nitpicky with the language. Uh, feats and paws. Canine characters are largely defined by their racial roles. 
like any race in the game. Consequently, the feats presented are optional and intended to add further flavor and specialization, but shouldn't be seen as mandatory. Dogs use their back for, oh yeah, the, the, to raise their hackles. These may be chosen if you're using the optional feat rolls. They are limited to specific classes as noted. Also, some feats have a prerequisite feat and act as a class progression alongside the chosen class path. Barbarian, Alpha of the Pack. Your howling fury establishes you as master of the hunt. Whilst raging, your allies have advantage on a single target that you are engaged with. It's pretty powerful. Feral cooperation. Uh, whilst you are raging, if your first attack hits a Tajay, an ally may use their reaction to move up to half their speed and immediately make a melee attack against the same target. This movement does not provoke opportunity attacks. It's pretty good, too. Savage Howl. Your rages are accompanied by feral howls that inflame the blood of your allies and drive them forward. An echo of ancient hunting packs. Each turn while you are raging, if you are hit with at least one attack, you may nominate one ally within 30 feet of you. That ally receives a 1d6 bonus to its next damage roll. You may nominate the same or a different ally each round, but damage bonuses do not stack. Playing a bard, bard of uh, amity. Your charisma ability score increases by one to a maximum of 20. Also, in addition to other bonuses provided by your college, a creature who uses your bardic inspiration die to make a successful roll may, as a bonus action, pass the bardic inspiration die to an ally within 30 feet. The recipient must use the inspiration die on their next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. The die is not passed again. Calming and Charming. Your best friend racial talent now allows you to uh, cast Calm Emotions instead of Charm Person. You add Charm Person to your list of bard spells known. Howling Melody. You may cast the Dispel, or I'm sorry, you may cast the spell Dissonant Whispers once per short rest without spending a spell slot and may cast this spell at first level. Wording it like that is a, a little odd. Like, you, you may do so. Um, like, do I have an alternative? <laughs> Howdy, Tin Cat. Uh, clerics get something. The Good Mother Canine Deity presents a new domain for canine clerics. The Companion Domain, presented below. Canine clerics who choose to follow a different deity should use the existing available rules for cleric characters. Uh, so they're not getting a feat, uh, but this is simply saying that you have the option uh, to go into this doggo uh, domain. All right, before we get too much further into this, uh, I want to get up and stretch a little bit uh, and take about a 10 minute break. Um, and then when we come back, let's finish up reviewing this document and see what the night holds for us. So hang in there, everyone. I'll be back in a little bit and we'll have some more dungeons and uh, doggies. Uh, well, I guess it's still play test. It's certainly not official, but as we're going through things, I think there's a couple things that could be tweaked. Uh, but then again, when when is there not, right? <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll be back in 10. <laughs> 